Well, I was going to say, Carl, you said you value reading this. I should say you use value reading this. <laughs> yes. Hello and welcome to the 132nd episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 17th of September 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. Today we are joined by our Emancipation Network comrades Kyle and Shane from General Intellect Unit for part two of our discussion of Paul Burkett's Marx and Nature a Red and Green Perspective. We recently just set up access to the Emancipation Network Discord server for all our patrons. So if you like discussing obscure Marxist economics, cybernetics, critical theory and Star Trek, why not become a patron? You also get two patron-only episodes and two live streams every month. Anyways, enough of that grifting, let's rejoin the discussion. This chapter also kind of emphasizes again this like separation and plunder thing. Like this is a theme that is going all the way through. It's going all the, all the way through Marx, right? That like it's the separation of people from their natural conditions of subsistence, and then those natural conditions appear as an alien force that is recombined with people via capital. So the only time you ever see a tree is when it's in the fucking lumber yard being chopped up by you, right? And then that that thing that thing is externalized as something to be plundered because you've been separated from it. And this is such an important point, this this point about the alienation of humanity from nature under capitalism is so important because it explains why we are faced with the ecological crises that we see today and feel utterly helpless to address them. Because... We see, like, nature under the system of private property, production of private, under private property, under the capitalist system, it appears as something alien to us. And the most basic and obvious facts that are taught to school children in terms of what we must do in order to survive as a species, we can understand them intellectually. But when we confront nature and say, well, how are we going to change our relationship to it? We feel completely powerless because the alien system of capitalism is operating according to its own logic. And it is coordinating our lives in a material level so that we, like, we may have the comprehension of what we need to do, but we feel like, you know, the world around us is something that we cannot connect to and grasp and change because of this use value, exchange value distinction, which creates an alienated relationship between humanity and nature. Absolutely. The, also, the productive laborers have been stripped of their productive relationship to the land. You know, yes. So, like that, that idea of like people having cattle on the commons is gone. The idea, although there's still a commons. Well, there was until like 20 years ago in that boy where I lived, there was like a commons where people living in the town could actually buy cattle and put them on and feed them there. Like that idea is like, that's totally gone now. And like, and also the relationship. So like if you're, if you're like working on your small plot of land, like, and you know, you know, you need to keep that land. You can't just zap the crap over for five years and make heavy money and then just like die you can't do that you can't have that relationship but when everybody's working in in productive capacity in a town or a factory or you know uh, do a zoom or something right that, they, that they're torn and ripped away from that connection so if there's a if somebody's trying to put a gas oil pipeline through like fucking canada or somewhere like that and everybody's stuck in one corner where it's warm and they don't live up there they don't have that relationship to the land like that alienation from the point of n- nature is fundamental in why capitalism can can do what it does ecologically. Yeah. Right. And even like with your 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 production process, even with your involvement in the production process, not just in consumption, right? Like I mean like this thing where like the if you work in some small manufacturer thing or whatever, the only time you encounter wood, you might never see a tree, but you will see it on on the bench in front of you as lumber to be operated on. 
or the only time you ever see in like a pig or whatever is if you work in a fucking slaughterhouse you know and this this kind of thing and you see it indoors in the dark you never see it outside this kind of stuff like it's kind of hard to not end up tr- like your brain being tricked into thinking of these things as alien objects from another fucking world that like have no meaning have no connection to anything they're just things to be operated upon and in these chapters burkett really emphasizes the importance of the division between town and country, right? And capitalism produces this division, right? That That's the origins of capitalism, actually, is people being moved off the land, out, off of a direct relationship to nature, and operating in a way that is mediated through capital by becoming wage laborers in the towns, Right. Like you see this whenever you whenever a third world country or a country in the global south underdeveloped country, quote unquote, is capitalized, it, whenever it becomes a capitalist country, the first thing that has to happen is that the peasantry have to be moved off the land. Right. And, you know, we, we see that with, you know, communism in the 20th century, too. Right. Like, you know, in, in Russia or whatever, any of these countries where they had. Uh, peasant based communism is you got to move the peasants off the land and into the cities because they're mimicking the same kind of production process that capitalism does. And, you know, that is why, like, we are alienated from the means of production as workers, including nature in general, right? Like, we're, we're literally spaced in our daily existence away from nature in such a way that we could actually just change our relationship to it the closest i get to nature most days is that from the back room of my apartment i can look out onto a car park and there's there's an abandoned car there that is swarming with mold and fungus and i I, that's the that's all the nature i can fucking see from the window (laughs) only in scotland only in scotland (laughs) 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 Um, but like there's something like just, I'm, you know, I'm down the country now, I'm in mean, my parents' house or whatever, and it's like, just to the level of which this alienation gets to me, like, like uh, my neighbour, she's got Alzheimer's and she's in the home, so our, the house beside my neighbour's, uh, right beside our house, is, is kind of, it's empty. She gets a gardener in, right? She gets this gardener in to, like, tend to make sure the house doesn't fall into, into ruin and repair and the gardener doesn't go crazy. And what he's doing is essentially where the, he doesn't want weeds to grow, he, he, he sprays Roundup, okay? Now, so all the, all the trees are slowly dying. Mm. Like, there's all these kind of fine trees and, like, sections of them are dead, you know, like, entire, like, a third of, lots of them. Just old sections, like a whole like large branch of a tree is like dead. Like and there's like ten or twenty of these. And it's like open bare soil, okay? And where he's spraying a roundup instead of like throwing even like just throw fucking grass seeds or wildflowers or something. It's like it's more efficient to spray roundup. So basically they're just like just like killing the soil. My mother who's a big gardener, like and she's all about attract the butterflies, I'll attract this. And what she does as well is she goes around with salt and washing powder and throws it to stop like <laughs> weeds growing so it's basically like poisoning your soil and then over here being organic it's just like people have this very messed up idea about bare soil grass it's just even people who are into the into nature it, it's so deeply embedded yeah well and this is marx's point right that it's not like if you live in the country you aren't alienated because if you live in the country in a capitalist system, you are still dependent on capitalist production, right? And there is an element of the social productive process living in the country that you are not a part of because you don't live in the town, right? Like when, when Marx and Engels talk about the division between town and country they want that to be transcended. They don't want everyone to go to the country and live a country life. You know, they don't want everyone to be a sack of potatoes, as <laughs> as Marx said about the French peasantry, right? Like, you know, when when what is it? Engels talks about the the, the idiocy of rural life. You know, he's he's not saying, oh yeah, you know, you go live in the countryside and and then you got it made. It's it's all over. Like I've seen this. You know, I've lived in the country and and. 
it, it, there's definitely an alienated nature to that as well. Like, that's why you get the rural politics of alienation and resentment is because the social being is divided and alienated from itself. Yeah, you're still going to be you're still going to be disciplined by that, regardless of kind of where you end up. Or uh, you know, even if you go way out into the sticks, it's going to catch up to you, as as Burkett does describe, right? The kind of like consolidation and spreading dynamic of capitalism, where it like roots into the ground in one place and hyper urbanizes and then spreads elsewhere and repeats the process over and over. That that machine will catch up with you, regardless. That was really good. Do you want to just explain, Shane, why it does that? Do you remember like how he explains it? So it, it kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of this process of urbanization, right? Like it's kind of drawing people together into one place by, you know, ejecting them from the land, drawing them together to concentrate them in one place with all the, the fixed capital, the plant and stuff. It kind of goes nuts and like destroys the environment around it. Putting putting everyone in that place causes them to unionize and stuff. So it gets too, too troublesome for capital. And then it goes somewhere else that's not yet urbanized and plunks itself down and does that again. Which you see a lot, especially in the United States, right? Like in, the, in its history of like the East Coast gets militantly unionized and the the, the, the the sweep of capital just proceeds west into places with less workers militancy. Yeah. And, South, southwest, yeah. Yeah, and so that's, that's the like consolidate, uh, like intensify and then spread, intensify, spread, intensify, spread dynamic. And, and he, he quotes, I think it's either Marx or Engels describing how this actually was happening in England at the village level before it happened at like the, the U S level, you know, like it, it, it was like you have one village that becomes a manufacturing town and then the workers become too militant. So then the capitalists would go and turn another village into a manufacturing town and a city and so on and so on. Indeed. And they also, he also kind of like zooms up to the kind of higher level of like the way that capital is sort of able to burn through particular ecosystems and destroy particular localities and seemingly burst through these limits by just shifting its attention somewhere else and destroying that instead. But this will collide with a global limit eventually. But it, it's it's not a contradiction to say that like capitalism can continue to operate even when its slash and burn tactics destroy the locality. It's just it will eventually run out of localities to destroy. But for the, for the moment, it is quite happy to do that. Yeah, it has an unprecedented a capacity in history to distribute itself geographically and thereby evade ecological crisis. Burkett also calls out specifically like the, you know, its development of communications and transport technologies that enable the distribution. But the distribution is not really ever decentralization. It's, it's like... It's, it's setting up more opportunities for centralized in-place intensification. It's, it's not that like, oh, there's, there's a, a, a moment of centralization and intensification, and then there's like a, a relaxing where things become more distributed and seem to go back to like a go backwards. No, it's, it's always going forwards. It's just doing this like sideways weaving scuttle to get there and like working its way through more and more resources, leaving more and more ash and rubble behind it. And just to be perfectly clear about why capitalism is able to do this, it's because it operates through the abstraction of value and it is able to, you know, use market relations to operate in a general global sense, whereas previous modes of production were tied directly to the land in a very real and material way. And so if, you know your crops got, or if your land got salted or your soil got exhausted, well, it's your land and everything's tied to that land, so you're basically screwed, right? So I'm I'm kind of aware that we've, uh, like this this is a lot of the stuff in chapter seven, which I think we've we've alluded to a lot of, but could, could we clarify exactly what this uh, value nature divergence or va- value, value use value, value nature divergence is? Just the kind of summary of what's going on there, because it's, it's a kind of background radiation in a lot of these discussions. Right. So Burkett uh, does chapter seven. It's called Capitalism in Nature, a Value Form Approach. Capitalism's social separation of workers vis-a-vis necessary conditions of production allows for a competitive, profit-driven development of the combined productive powers of labor and nature. This separation and combined development with its increasingly complex 
and technologically advanced social division of labor loosens the constraints placed on production by particular natural conditions. It does so, however, only by broadening and deepening human appropriation from and material impacts on nature in line with the imperatives of competitive profit-making. Capitalism thus overcomes particular natural limits only by placing increasing pressure on the global biosphere as a whole. The social roots of capitalism's environmental crisis tendencies are only fully revealed, however, when one considers the tensions with nature built into the value form of commodities, money, and capital. So he basically goes back to Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1, and the description of the value form there, right? So he starts by saying uh, the commodity, like all use values, is a product of both labor and nature. Value, the substance of wealth in its specifically capitalist form, is, however, simply the abstract social labor time objectified in commodities. So uh, again, for the listener to clarify, use value is not a type of value. Use value and value are distinct and antithetical things. It's very confusing, but that that's that's the terminology that Marx is using. Right. So the use value is the utility, like the sensuous, real kind of usefulness of a thing. The use value is actually the material of the thing. It it is the material, but it's also all the sensuous qualities of the thing. It's essentially like whatever a human being moves into nature, moves through nature and picks out a object as an object that is in their possession. Everything about that object, like, you know, how it makes you feel, it, its exploitable natural qualities, its mass, its substance, all of its chemical composition, all that stuff is the use value of the thing. Absolutely. And so, like, the value of the thing is that is the average amount of socially necessary labor time to make that thing. So you can have two identical objects. One, one, one stereo system made this year with 10 hours of labor and an identical object from last year that made took 20 hours of labor. Both of them are identical at an atomic level. Both have the same use value, okay? But they have a different value, okay? And you can also have an ob- two different objects that have different use values, like an apple and an orange, and they've got exactly the same amount of socially necessary labor time in them. So they have different use values with the same value. You can have the same use value and different values. And then, and then we're not even talking about exchange value, <laughs> which is essentially, in modern terms, we can just think of it as the price. Yeah. yeah? So, and the price won't necessarily be the... It, it, is, it will have a correlation to the amount of labor in it, probably, but there are so many rents and patents and copyrights all manner of stuff going on in, in the real world that pull the price of a thing away from its true amount of socially necessary labor time value. So we've got these, these three bad boys, okay? And mo- most errors in most, you know, stuff we read about, like Marx, in, interpretations of Marx and stuff like that come from just rudimentary, conf- you know, mixing up of those three simple, but fundamentally, to me, I think that's Marx's most fundamental insight in economic theory is the value form. Because practically everything flows from it, except from like exploitation. But all the other stuff flows from this. You do not need really exploitation so much to get a falling rate of profit. You know, you, but, you, but you need the value form to get that stuff. Yes. Yeah. And this contradiction is also like very core to what Burkett is doing in this book, right? That like... As living beings, we are concerned most with with the like use value, the utility of objects, and the the way they can help us live. But capitalism and markets, as the, as this like capitalist system, is concerned with the value, the, the like social necessary labor time. And this is a like this is the half blind accounting, where the only thing that's accounted for is this metric 
of human labor time expended on things, but not the actual usefulness or the like anti-usefulness of, of things like where toxic waste is anti-useful. It's like an, an anti-particle of utility, but it's still produced because it's, it's profitable to do so. And this fundamental divergence is the, the divergence of capitalism from its, its natural basis. It's, it's, not the, it's not the divergence of humanity from nature. It's, it's, the, it's that capital orchestrates a, di- a divergence between the social system that humans are organized under versus the like material nat- natural substrate on which it's based. So it's not really humans that are in the driving seat here for this thing. It's the, the uh, like, like that thing that Moore was going on about with the, like, Anthropocene sort of stuff. It's like, well, it's, it's not Anthropos that's doing this. It's cap- Capitalos is the, yeah. thing that's, is the thing that's doing this. You can look at a graph of, they have historical graphs of economic growth. And you can look at it and, you know, it's literally going at between 0 and 1% growth until about 1650. And then it just goes... <laughs> So there was humans before then, right? And we didn't have that growth dynamic. So, you know, like, it is in the social organization that has caused that. And it's not an intrinsic, it's not a a thing of humans to be like that outside of their material and social relations. I think that's the way to put it. Yeah. One one thing, before we go, there's one thing, like, there's a place where he, where he, he called, where he described like value and i think he described it as a, as a in a good way is that it's it is a social it is a social measure of wealth is a good way to put it yeah but it's not a very good one <laughs> that's the point yeah and like the whole thing as well is like the, the, like you know the social relation with the value form and how it operates it means that not only is everything like you know we only value commodities essentially but the the social relations actually determine what the commodities are i think like that he touches on this bit but i think it's very important like you know i can't as a you know i i'm living in the same countryside here now with parents i can't like go cycling around some of the busy roads here like capitalism doesn't give me that there's loads of things i would like to be able to buy i'd love to be able to buy clean air or like fucking you know Oh, there's loads of stuff that, that capital cannot give you. It literally, it, it, the social relations will prevent from being a thing. Like more free time is what we all, we all want more. Who the fuck wants to be working more? Capitalism can't offer us that at, on a systemic level. So like, it's a goddamn shitty measure of wealth. You know, it's a shit measure of wealth. Yeah, well, and that, that is because in capitalism, ultimately all production is production for sale. So everything has to be mediated through capitalist valuation. Like you can make stuff, you know, as a hobby or whatever, but that can't be like at a certain point, if you're going to do your hobby that you love doing and you make these things you love at a certain point, you are going to have to enter into market relations with your hobby. It'll become your work. You'll be selling the stuff. And then the quality of the thing that you are selling will also change because it has become a commodity. It's just the way it is because, you know, we are social beings. We reproduce ourselves socially. So you cannot live in a capitalist society and not live off of things you buy on the market. That's just a basic fact. And that means you're always compelled to produce for the market. Yeah, and it's it's also the, it's the same for the production side as well. Like you can like I mean, there's there's this niche sort of artisan whatever stuff, but it's always going to be this niche kind of elite consumption stuff because you'll, I mean, you can make your hand woven baskets or whatever, but you're up against fucking everyone else that's making commodity baskets, and it it's a losing game every time unless there's some unless you have some bizarre pitch that's like oh these are. These are like this is why so much of that like artisanal crap is like they put so much into the marketing of it because that's the only thing they can really sell because ultimately it's the same basket as everything else is and trying trying to make a living off of doing that isn't isn't going to work out in the long run really um, right like, like the arts and crafts movement is essentially trying to ignore these basic social facts that we are laying out here and just pretending they're not there. And through, like, force of will saying, oh, no, but we're going to make use values for use values sake. They only exist on the surplus of the bourgeois. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so I just want to, you know, skim through the basic points that more, or sorry, not more, <laughs> Burkett is bringing <laughs> up in this chapter. 
Sorry, apologies to both Moore and Burkett uh, for that, because I know they, they don't get along. So, All right, so quantitatively, capitalism only ascribes value to nature insofar as its appropriation requires commodity-producing labor, even though nature's contribution to production and to human life more generally is not materially reducible to this labor of appropriation. So Tom, you already brought this point up. In short, the value form qualitatively and quantitatively abstracts from nature's useful and life-giving characteristics, even though value is a particular social form of wealth, a particular social objectification of both nature and labor. This contradiction helps explain capitalism's tendency to despoil its natural environment, which is the main argument of this chapter. A second corollary argument is that the common complaint that Marx's value theory inadequately recognizes the productive role of net limited natural conditions should be redirected towards capitalism itself. So those are the things we kind of brought up. And, you know, I think we've hit most of the points that Burkett brings up in this chapter. Maybe there's a tiny minor point that, like, it's he also emphasizes like the simplification and homogenization of nature, that the like yeah. the variety reduction, that value is treated as being uh, what it's it's quantitative but homogenous, whereas nature is qualitative and heterogeneous. Um, but like the the value form tramples all over this and smashes it into a grid of a grid of like coordination of things. It it tries to homogenize nature wherever possible in order to increase the regularity of turnover and the predictability of production just the cheapness as well just the actual labor efficiency the cheapness yeah and there's, there's, an, there's an art there's an excerpt here david harvey who uh i give out about a lot because he's hardly even a value theorist can i read this quote of harvey here because on, on this point here i think it's good yeah sure money prices attached to particular things sorry I'm just going to drink water. Actually, Kyle, will you read it? It's on page 86. Fuck it. <laughs> All right. So Harvey says, Money prices attach to particular things and presuppose exchangeable entities with respect to which private property rights can be established or inferred. This means that we conceive of entities as if they can be taken out of any ecosystem of which they are a part. We presume to value the fish, for example, independently of the water in which they swim. The money value of a whole ecosystem can be arrived at, according to this logic, only by adding up the sum of its parts, which are constructed in an atomistic relation to the whole. Indeed, pursuit of monetary valuations commits us to a thoroughly Cartesian Newtonian Lockean and in some respects, anti-ecological ontology of how the natural world is constituted. So you run into this problem with, for example, the attempts to marketize natural goods, right? Like we're gonna we're gonna take this ecosystem we want to protect, we're gonna put a price on it, and then we're gonna marketize it so that that people will say, oh yeah. I value, you know, this this national park this much and therefore it can have a market price and people will pay for it because they value it subjectively, right? The problem with that is, is you end up in this summing up all the individual components approach, which is absolutely nonsense. Like I know personally people who have worked in environmental ministries and had consultants come in and try to do this approach. And they're just sitting there being like, this is absurd. This is completely absurd. Like they get a, they get a, a directive from the minister to, you know, implement this market based ecological protection scheme. And they're looking at like, how do you value a frog? You know, that people, people don't consume as a commodity. It's not like they eat the frogs. It's just how do you value the presence and existence of a frog independent of the holistic ecological system in which it exists? The winning move is to not play in this game. I think it, it's it's very it's like the um it's the reductivism the like modern like Cartesianism that Pickering was railing against in the Cybernetic Brain, right? So that like these are these are complex systems that are 
living and composed of more than the sum of their parts because they're so they're relational. But this 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 is a like this is a social system of derangement, right? Like it is it has gone off in its own bizarre loop that is completely diverged from the reality of the world. Uh, but it in, it insists on reimposing its its crazed view of how things work back onto the world and destroying it in the process. You know, and there are these like market based carbon credit schemes and this kind of thing and they become the the subject of capitalist speculation and you know the criminal underworld uses them to launder money and all this kind of stuff but like you know for me personally like when it really hit home how absurd these carbon credit schemes are was when i was in new zealand the other year I, we were traveling through the mountains and we saw these uh, large swaths of forest that had been planted in with pine because pine is a very fast growing tree and therefore it's very uh, it, it's very good at capturing carbon, right? Like it, your your carbon capture per annum is very good with a pine tree, right? And it's sur- these little patches of pine forest are surrounded with the native trees of New Zealand. And they're just radically different species, you know? And I heard that there were fires in this part of New Zealand, you know, before I went there, like in the, in the previous year. And they were saying like, this is the first time they've had a major forest fire like this in the history and recorded history here. Because that's just not what the climate and the ecology does. And the, the trees there, the natural trees, the, the, the indigenous trees are not suited to burns because they just don't happen. And then it's like you realize the reason the burns were happening, the forest fires were happening, is because they came into this e- ecosystem, cleared out a bunch of land, and p- planted a bunch of pine. So their carbon their carbon capture scheme was actually causing forest fires that were putting more carbon into the atmosphere. You know? Like, you just got to go around uh, Ireland. Shane, you know this. Ireland, in 1900, Ireland had 1% forest cover. I think it was the most deforested country and maybe in the world at one stage. Now it's back up to 10. But what have they, what have they planted it with? They planted it with spruce. Yeah. And why did they plant it with it? Because it grows three times faster in Irish soil than it does in Norway, right? But, but the problem is, is that when you've got these pine forests, they drop pines, which are acidic. And so the, the floor of the forest is covered in acidic pines. It's dead. No birds hardly live in it. There's no ecosystem going on. There's hardly a mushroom in a pine forest. So you've got these large swathes of pine it's just like killing things. And I'm sure that's why they went on fire because it's like, there's basically tinder on the ground, the dry tinder that would yeah. have been like in a wet environment. You know, it, you can't, it's just impossible to understand how badly these are. These things are even run in the, on their own logic. In the European Union, they had to set the price of the carbon. And so they had to set up all the infrastructure and then they had to make the political decision of what price are we going to set it at? And the, 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 the ecologists or whatever were saying like, well, it needs to be set at like, 50 euros a, a carbon ton or something and the politicians went oh that would affect production too much so they said I oh, will set it at like 10 so it ended up having no effect so it becomes a scheme for like literally financial trading and weird just speculative it's just speculative and and when they were setting up these schemes you had experts saying like you know experts who are used to like financial regulation and this kind of stuff market regulation they're saying Well, you're setting this thing up and it's just going to become a nightmare of speculation and money laundering. And and they're saying, no, like this is for good. This is we're we're doing this for like pro-social reasons. We're setting up these carbon credits. People are going to do it because of their conscience. No, of course not. The value form is determinative in the final instance here. Yeah, like, and the other thing about, like, I've, I've seen some stuff of, you know, what you're talking about there. You know, they had some people, like, in the rainforest in Brazil or something, up, like, with <laughs> measuring the amount of CO2 that's going in and how much oxygen is coming out. And they're going, oh, yeah, like, and now we can put a, a strict measure and we can make a value price on this stuff. But the problem with all that rubbish is, right, what happens if it's more profitable to cut down the forest and fucking grow cattle? Should you do it? It gets, like, you're, under the, you're, you're, you're giving into the logic straight away. Because, like, 
it must be happening for some reason that these forests are getting. You can plunder the virgin forest. You can sell that oak, or not oak, but like uh, teak and like these expensive hardwoods. You know, and then you can put cattle on it, ranch it, and make make money every single year while the while the earth burns. Yeah, and the problem is that these schemes come from the perspective of neoclassical economics where the engagement of the individual with the market is about a subjective ranking of values, right? So the idea is if I, as an ethical human being, decide that I value ecological continuity and health above short-term profit, I will invest in carbon credits because I care personally as a subjective individual about that issue. And then you just educate enough investors and consumers in the value of this. And subjectively as individuals, they will vote with their dollars to protect this. But when you look at it from like a Marxist value perspective, it's a complete absurdity because you understand the social holism of this problem and the ecological holism of this problem, not what a subjective ranking of values at the individual level would achieve. Indeed. And I mean, it can even backfire with like, you know, uh, you, you make it a sort of personal virtue thing and a kind of like preference thing. And then you're going to get people, you know, deliberately rolling coal, as they say, like making it a fucking, a fuck you to the libs to like deliver. Right. Yeah, for sure. Fucking. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And like trigger, that, the, like trigger the libs by that. buying coal. Right. Yeah. Or, yeah. or people who like work in oil and gas stuff and they, they know which side their bread is buttered on. They're like, well, yeah, f- fuck these, fuck these libs. We're going to have to go with the, the oil and gas stuff. Yeah. I mean, you still see people in, in Calgary here walking around with t-shirts that say, I heart, and it has a little picture of Alberta, and it has a drop of oil. You no. know, oh my god! Is a, is a, this was a propaganda campaign that was rolled out by the oil and gas industry here, and it really took at the popular level. And people just they have it on their bumper stickers, you know, they have it on their T-shirts, <laughs> it, their hats. And yeah, it's it's like I'm triggering the libs by wearing this shirt, you know? Yeah, Christ. I must say I do like the concept of triggering the libs though. I think it's you know, I do I do admire them for it. You know, no, no matter how how scumdungery <laughs> it is, triggering the libs, I stand by it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is, when you're doing it in a way that is like obviously astroturfed by some PR firm. <laughs> like it's it's it's, it's <laughs> foolishness. It's just pure foolishness. <laughs> no, you gotta run control. Yeah. You gotta run control. Uh. So there's a there's a couple of things. There's one bit in here where he he, he get, getting on from um, from what Kyle was talking about not neoclassical economics. They have a quote here from Solo, Robert Solo. He's like you know arch god. I think he's MIT professor, you know, neoclassical math genius guy. And, you know, he talks about, like, you know, how supply and demand will work to solve all our problems. You know, he goes, as the Earth's supply of particular natural resources near exhaustion, and as natural resources become more and more valuable, the motive to economise those natural resources should become as strong as the motive to to economise labour. The productivity of natural resources should ride faster than than now. It's hard to imagine otherwise. And he goes, blah, 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 blah. But your mind like goes through like, you know, and, and breaks down like a, most of these arguments. It's like, you know, what happens when like, say like, for example, let's take like white rhinos or something, right? They were hunted for their horn. And it was probably reasonably hard to get the horn and you know, to hunt them. And then, then you would get some good money, right? But as they became rarer, the value of like selling that rhino horn was worth a lot of money. So now people would, now I've got to harder until you fucking wipe them out. That's the logic from a lot of, you know, the logic is actually not you get to a place where they're more expensive. Is that they get more expensive and then you go all out, you yeah. destroy the thing and you get it all. That's that's the actual logic. Do you get to a point of where there's 20 left and then you then if they're the wrong species, if they if they if they don't have the, you know, the reproductive rate, 
for you to to come back from the brink, then they're they're done. They use the logic of of whale oil and all that kind of stuff. The logic is hunted practical extinction. That's that is the that is the logic. I think the logic for capital when it comes to a system wide will be it'll be kind of similar, although I don't think you can get all the way to extinction, but it'll get close enough. I think it'll it'll continue to ruin shit pretty badly and like I could certainly imagine like this ever decree because like I think that the author here puts a lot of emphasis on like the deg- progressive degradation of living conditions. I could I could certainly imagine capital capital continuing to operate in its psychotic way as things just keep, continue to get worse and worse. And you end up with like it, what what remains of humanity living in fucking underground bunkers and they're like, "Well, hey, you know, at least we're not dead or whatever." And it keeps keeps getting worse and worse and worse while whatever's left of the like stock market just keeps happening you know and keeps going nuts but shane that's where the dialectic kicks in that's the dialectic you know like that's the systemic logic i do think that's the dialectic kicks in before we get there that's that's my own personal there's one other um bit here but there's one bit here like i think he does talk excellently about the value form and and all that but when he, he tries to touch on like a thermodynamics slightly and brings it into a Marxist point of view, where and you know to me this is like actually he gets stuff wrong here. There's a bit on page one hundred three, okay, where he talks about he quotes Elmer Alfater. He says, "In the creation of value, it is in fact only labor that is able to create value and surplus value. From the standpoint of the energy cycle, labor, i.e., the worker, is brought to put more energy." brains, muscle, heart and hand into the process that he in the end gets out of it in the form of energy and matter. The surplus goes to the capitalist in the form of surplus value. But like, that's just wrong. Like, <laughs> right? So think about this, right? Like, say I'm employed to teach some kids, okay? And I'm employed for one day I teach and I get paid like, I don't know, like, what are the teachers, right? They're probably getting like, you know, 200 euro a day to teach, Okay. Right, I put a certain amount of energy. Well, how many, how much food, for example, do I need to to, to uh, teach that day? You know, X grams of pasta or whatever. But with that two hundred euro, I can buy like probably a hundred kilos of goddamn pasta. Like that, you, you can put in less energy and get more energy out monetarily. So that way of trying to put thermodynamics into value theory, that is a, a total error. That does not make any sense from a val from a value point of view there's a surplus but from an energy point of view there may be a deficit so even though there's a, a surplus a value surplus say it, it can be there'll be a deficit so I, I think even burkett falls prey to trying to misapply value theory yeah definitely right yeah that, that one's that one's pretty weird right like i guess uh... We'll probably have to, we'll probably have to read the the fuck is that Beale book the entropy of capitalism I think there's there's maybe a better thermodynamics thing in there but yeah this this thing of like you can certainly think of like at the very highest level of like the kind of thermodynamics of the Earth system itself right that like everything is ultimately energy received from the sun and it's an open system that receives new energy every day and any given any given organism is also an open system but so, so there's a lot, I don't know a lot of people misunderstand the thermodynamic stuff about as being about closed systems. Like that, that quote about closed systems kind of coming to equilibrium, but there's no reason for an open system to do that. It could be surplus deficits all over the fucking place. There's there's no reason for that to, to balance out that way. Do you get more energy out of podcasting? <laughs> Definitely than you put in. No, I don't think so. No, Definitely it's a not. it's a tiring no. exercise. I'm usually kind of wiped out the, the day after a medium session. Do you want to give us like a kind of quick rundown of like the, the whistle stop tour of concepts in part three? And then I guess we can just kind of crawl through the, the final chapter. So in part three, uh, we're mainly concerned with communism. But the first chapter 11 is the nature and historical progressivity of capitalism. So this chapter is describing why Marx thought capitalism was progressive and how he thought it was progressive right because you know there's this claim like you know burkett lays it out here he says uh perhaps the most common ecological criticism of marx is that in applauding capitalism's development of the productive forces as a precondition of communism he succumbs to a promethean or productivist conception of history 
Prometheanism, firmly rooted in the Enlightenment tradition, says that human progress hinges on the subjugation of nature to human purposes. Human development thus involves a struggle between people and nature in which people come out on top. The critics labeling Marx a Promethean typically suggest that he foresees a continuation and even an intensification of human domination over nature under communism, conceived as a society of ever-expanding per capita levels of material production and consumption, with reduced work time as enabled by further development of the mechanized technologies bequeathed by capitalism. So like the fully automated luxury communism idea, basically. So he is going to go through and basically provide textual evidence to say that one, the reason why Marx and Engels saw capitalism as progressive was because it, it removed the necessary relationship the determinate relationship between an exploiting coordinator class and an exploited producing class because of the level of material abundance it could create. So in historical materialism, there is a recognition that prior to capitalism, you essentially had two options. You could have an egalitarian hunter-gatherer society, or you could have a class-based exploitative society that was based on agriculture, more or less. And, you know, they essentially followed, like, prior to capitalism, they essentially follow Aristotle in saying that every society must have slaves. Like, it could be a peasant, it could be a slave, it could be an indentured servant, it could be a serf, it could be any number of different kinds of exploited worker but there must be exploited workers because otherwise society is not going to have enough food and goods to produce itself reproduce itself under capitalism that necessity is removed even as the relationship of domination continues it, it opens the door to the possibility of a higher level of communism where we are not engaging in exploitative relations with each other, but we still all have enough to live and can have a varied and sophisticated social life. And like two of the prongs of this are the socialization of production by stitching together previously isolated units of, of life production into like globe spanning totalities of, of, of interconnectedness. And also that the development of the productive force is both mechanical and human kind of remove the scarcity justification for class exploitation that like there was it was necessary to subjugate yourself to the king because of like scarce conditions and so on is the only person capable of coordinating society in those conditions the hyperabundance can remove any of those justifications and it removes the justification for capitalism itself really right ultimately so the capitalism is supposed to melt down that way it opens the way to the complete abolition of class society and crucially, there's no way to get there without going through this horrific nexus of, of acceleration. That, like, it's, it's it, it, contrary to the reactionary ideal where there's, like, oh, the, the way to paradise is to go backwards. There's there's nothing for us backwards. It's just more fucking tyranny. More more degenerate forms of tyranny. Like, the, the, the way he's quoting Marx here is that, like, it's, it's, it's not that the future communist society will be an orgy of consumption. It'll be a less restricted relation between humans and nature yes. not in the sense of less restricted as you will be a free to trample all over it like crazy it's that you'll it'll be more like say the culture or whatever where it's this like hyper developed rational and like guess like loving relationship with nature right that like it's we we can now actually appreciate our materiality and the materiality of the world and relate to it properly as as we should relate to it without all these class distortions and these these tyrannies um, but the, you can't get there by turning back. You can't get there by staying in capitalism. It has to push through and actually liquefy those relations. Right. That is the second reason they give for why Marx saw capitalism as progressive, which is that it allows for a this this freer relationship with nature that was previously restricted to closer to bare survival. I think that's a that's an exaggeration. Because, you know, obviously there are many pre-capitalist cultures or pre-agricultural cultures that have quite a, quite a deep 
a varied culture, but nonetheless, you know, we can imagine that having an understanding of, e of ecology, having an understanding of the world as a whole, as opposed to just the small part of it we live in, we could have a more varied relationship to, to nature than would have been possible in a hunter-gatherer society. There's like bits here where he's quoting so from Marx that like on the one hand comparing the kind of past as like mere nature idolarity versus the future in which we're capable of a freer recognition of nature as their real body. Yeah. And that that latter part sounds kind of bong rip and stuff, but it's it's that's really cool, right? Like that like on the one hand you have this mere sort of like idolization of nature, and then you have this like futuristic like recognition recognition of that nature is our body. Right, like that. That we are social material beings, and this this is like a, it's a very like it's post post Cartesian post Cartesian understanding of nature. Yeah, deeply dialectical. When you read these things, you go, "How can you have these crude interpretations of what he says?" I know maybe you've not read everything, but it's it's like if you, you know, <laughs> yeah. One of the big things as well, there's a tendency he talks about getting away from this kind of Prometheanism. Yeah, Marx talks about the tendency of like increasing in free time and the tendency of free time to be less intensive for material stuff than productive work. So if you're working 40 hours a week now, if you're only working 10 hours a week, you know, the, the, the 10 hours you're working versus the 30 you would be working. Now your 30 are probably much more competitive or... And I mean, let, let's be realistic for, you know, your average worker. We're talking closer to 60, like 60 or 70 hours yeah. a week. Mm -hmm. Especially the pushy podcasters, yeah. you know, it's a tough, you know, it's a tough grind. <laughs> <laughs> if you get it down to 10, yeah. I mean, like you spend, you spend the rest of your time hanging around, get a hammock out the back, go fishing, all that kind of shit. Yeah. But it's, it's weird. Like, I know like uh, we're, we're comics, but, you know, like, when I look back at when was I happiest in my life, you know, I would say, when I was in college, you know, I was broke, right? And you had, like, people you were hanging around with, you were, like, you were broke all the time. But, like, the stimulation that you had or just the general camaraderie and the communal, even the communal living that you have when you're in college or in a dormitory or with a house with your, with your friends or someone that who you choose, like... This idea that consumption, that when we would have a communist society, people would be going like an orgy of consumption, it seems counterintuitive to me. I don't think that's the case. I think actually, after a while, I think people would settle down to really quite, I think, quite parsimonious lives, really. Like, if we think about the lockdown, what's happened to people in the lockdown, I've heard loads of people saying, well, God, I don't, I don't spend half of the money. I don't miss it. You know, I miss the people, but I don't miss the... The rubbish, you know what I mean? And I think there's a, you know, we're not trying to sell a kind of a, you know, a primitive anarcho, but I think there's a, there's definitely an element to like that in what I would expect to happen in a communist society. We could certainly chill it out, certainly. And that's why I kind of hate that fucking Aaron Bastani, Novara Media like oh you know where, where they have the the picture of the fucking infinity pools and like this is what communism is it's, no it's fucking not like come on like get out of there with that shit i can definitely understand like how like if you're if you're in this kind of abjected alienated state and you would really like to sit in an infinity pool that's a sort of appealing vision of communism of of like this kind of like abject luxury like taken to its it, its extreme because it could be like oh because because if if you're starving you want a shit ton of food right that's that's what how that works but that's that's definitely not what Marx has gone on about. It's not like a feasible or like sensible relation to nature in the slightest. We should be thinking more in terms of like cooling our shit down and in terms of consumption as as communism rather than like ramping it up so that oh everyone's gonna have an infinity pool. Imagine imagine just like a completely flat fucking desert of concrete you know with suburbia but with infinity pools. yeah yeah but but also suburbia is everything like everything is fucking paved flat to make suburbias and that's that's nature is obliterated completely that's that seems to be where that stuff's going and it's fucking horrible you know it's petty bourgeois communism communism for people who who like changing the furniture every three years they like all the tacky shit that the fucking bougies do yeah <laughs> Thank you. 
On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Thank you.